so I think um, I think we can uh, we can we can get started, um, and um, and anybody else who who joins, uh, they can just sort of trickle in. Um, so uh, just before we start, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, um, who are the Bejigal people uh, um, from where I am, and if anybody. Uh, feels moved to uh, put in the name of the traditional custodians of the land where they are in the chat, please feel free to do so. Um, I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and I'd like to extend those respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders who are on this call today. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Emanuele, who's going to, um, uh, who's going to chair this session. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to a new episode of the Theory of Living System webinar series. Uh, today, we are honored to have Professor Andela Saric. I hope I'm saying this right, Andela Saric, um, from UCL. Uh, Andela uh, got a PhD in uh, chemical physics uh, from uh, Columbia University and then moved to Cambridge, where she was a postdoc at the Department of um, uh, Chemistry and a research fellow at the Emmanuel College. And now uh, she is at UCL. She is an assistant professor of biological and soft matter at the Department of Physics and uh, Astronomy, where she studies biological assemblies using computer simulations. And she is also the head of the uh, Saric lab for computational biological and soft matter uh, physics. And today uh, she will talk about sensing and creating mechanical forces by driven protein assembly. And as always, if you have uh, questions, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat and we will resolve them at the end of the, of the talk. And without any further uh, introduction, please welcome uh, Professor uh, Sarit. Great, thank you so much, um, Amano, for the great introduction and ah. <laughs> also producing it so well. I mean, the pronunciation, actually, the first name is Angela, this D with the bar, it's, it's this weird letter in. in Okay. In language, I think it's, my parents didn't have very big plans for me, <laughs> like giving me all these <laughs> Croatian letters. Um, so it's great to um, to meet you guys, and um, okay. I hope to also have some uh, interesting discussions with um, the audience who's joining today. Um, and I guess that's the um, advantage of these uh, online seminars. We can really extend our discussions across the continent, uh, across the, the globe. Um, so today uh, I'll speak about making and feeling mechanical forces by protein assemblies. And I'll start with what I think drives me in um, my research is this notion that cell is basically a dense solution of macromolecules, you know, like soup. And then these macromolecules somehow assemble into structures that make us alive. Like they make filaments that enable cells to move, to divide. They make networks and lattices that do transport, that sense forces uh, from, the, uh, from the outside. And what's really important to notice here is that these assemblies not only give, you know, are not only, materials of fantastic mechanical properties that give shape and support cells, but they're machines and as such, they to perform work, they need to consume energy. And actually the energy is often consumed not for the assembly, but for disassembly. So these structures always need to be at this fine balance between assembled and disassembled such that they can complete their cycle and keep on producing work. So we are very much interested in how these building blocks driven by energy form um, nanoscopic nanomachinery. And in fact, we know when protein assembly in the cell occurs without energy input, severe pathologies can develop. A good example are amyloid aggregates, which um, assemble without any energy input and then never go back and um, can make problems. 
So these are kind of general questions that motivate us in our research. And our approach is theoretical. And kind of it's important to recognize to create these assemblies, of course, you need to take many, many individual molecules. Uh, but then there's this whole gap. How do you go from individual mole molecules that have a certain you know, structure and dynamics all the way to continuum scale? And there is a gap not only in the computational techniques, but also actually in the experimental techniques around um, at, at this nanoscale. And what we try to do, so we argue that to capture this phenomenon, one still needs to retain the building blocks, but doesn't necessarily need to know where each atom and each water molecule go at each point in time. So what we try to do, we develop minimal coarse grain models where we try to capture only the key ingredients on the molecular shape or effective interactions, such as we can simulate a large number of those under thermal fluctuations and see how they assemble into machinery that can uh, produce something useful at a continuum scale. So in this way, we try to bridge this molecular and continuum representations. And as I said in the beginning, these, um, the molecular assemblies in the cell are driven, they consume energy, and they're really, oh, and just say that this research is, is rooted in soft matter physics, um, but also interfaces with physical chemistry and we use computer simulations to answer life science questions. And there are really three main ways how um, assemblies are driven out of equilibrium in the cell. Probably the simplest way, maybe uh, the most ancient way is by gradients in chemicals. Um, and one example are mechanosensitive channels, which are proteins that uh, operate under gradients of osmolites. Another very uh, prominent way is by consuming energy-rich mo energy -rich molecules, such as ATP. And this is another topic um, that we study in the lab in the context of membrane reshaping by active escort 3 filaments. And the third uh, main way is by mechanical forces that push and pull proteins, change their shapes, and therefore control their assemblies. Um, so these are the kind of general problems that we study in the lab. Today I'll speak about uh, the first two, proteins that sense uh, mechanical forces through the chemical gradients and proteins that consume ATP to reshape cells. And then we also work quite a bit on the pathological kind of passive assembly in the context of amyloid aggregation, which I will speak about today. So let me start about this fun, useful protein assemblies that do stuff for us. And I'll start with probably uh, the simpler version, which is um, sensing forces by protein assemblies. And this is kind of the first uh, functional protein assembly example that we studied in the lab, where I decided that we should really move from pathological assembly, which is what we studied uh, in the last eight years, to something that um, produces useful work. And this seemed like the simplest place to start. So let me tell you a bit about um, these proteins that um, sense mechanical forces. So probably the simplest um, machine that uh, senses mechanical forces are bacterial mechanosensitive channels. And I mean, I still find them quite fascinating even though um, they're relatively simple in design. So what they are, they're um, a bunch of transmembrane helices connected by loops that sit in the membrane. And then when a um, bacterial cell is under osmotic shock, for instance, um, it's under hyper, hyper osmotic shock, water will flow into the cell, the cell will tense up, it will increase in the volume, membrane will tense, and this membrane tension will stretch um, the channel, will open a pore, and let the solids through to equilibrate the pressure. And these guys um, seem to be non-specific, so they will let something through based simply on the size. So they seem to work really kind of in a physical way. And um, so this is kind of a structural view of um, how they might work. So um, on the left, there is their closed structure. So you see these transmembrane helices, which in my view are just rods hydrophobic rods connected by loops. And then when the membrane stretches, so membrane thins, these guys kind of want to stay in contact with the membrane, so they will tilt and open a pore kind of in an iris way. And um, 
even in the last years, um, there was this debate that these channels might actually not work independently, but might cooperate with each other. So, um, of course, they we know the proteins don't live by themselves. They're surrounded by many other proteins, but also their own copies. And actually, um, a nice work um, in Australia by the Martinez group showed that in vitro um, bacterial channels or the uh, mechanosensitive channels of large conductance cluster. Um, this was in supported bilayers. You see a huge cluster of these channels. Then in reconstituted uh, liposomes, you see uh, kind of, uh, dots of channels clustering. And this, these are clusters um, of E. coli mechanosensitive channels of large uh, conductors gathered by Pilejata group at Edinburgh. So, and then there was this discussion, why would they cluster? What, how can that contribute to their function? And um, what patch clamp experiment from the Martinez group showed is that a channel of, let's say, a cluster of, let's say, 11 channels behaved in terms of their conductance more like a patch of five channels. So kind of they were conducting less than they would um, individually. So we were actually confused by that a bit because um, some theoretical work previously um, predicted that channels, as they come close to each other, should help each other open rather to close. So um, that seemed to me like the simplest, ma simple ma simplest machine to start playing with in our simulations. And what we really wanted to build is I mean, exactly you know, a thinking tool that you imagine in your head. Can we have some rods connected by uh, loops, put them in a membrane and see um, how they interact? And those are really minimal toy models, but they preserve the correct physics um, at a nanoscale given the ingredients that you put in. So what we decided to do is um, take a simple channel, let's say imagine five rods um, for the sake of argument. And these rods have a hydrophobic body, which is here in gray. They have a hydrophilic head that stick out. And then we they have also hydrophilic interior, meaning non-hydrophobic, such that the um, lipids would not flow in. And we embed them, embed them in a membrane. A membrane is, for us, a very simple three beads per lipid membrane, where um, interior is hydrophobic, so it likes to stick to itself, and the heads are simply volume excluded. And then there is no solvent. This is an implicit um, member model by the Zerner that captures the correct mechanical properties of um, the phospholipid bilayers. So um, initially, we put such a channel, and then we connect these um, rods by springs um, between each other. We put it um, in, in the membrane and we apply osmotic shock exactly the way that a bacterial cell would experience. We'd put a bunch of um, solutes, non-specific solutes. So for us, they're just volume excluded beads on one side of the membrane. A membrane is fettered in the middle such that it doesn't move uh, like a piston when you release all this pressure. So these beads hit the membrane and due to collisions, they will increase tension um, the membrane will stretch under this tension, which will open up channels and then channels will start gating. So we didn't impose any kind of um, ge geometrical conformational changes. We simply have these rods connected with springs and you'll see here, I will um, zoom into an individual channel when there is tension, on average, this channel opens up more exactly in this iris of manner that um, structural studies predicted, then it opens a transient pore that lets solids through and then you equilibrate the pressure on two sides. And now we can start playing the games and um, seeing how many of these interact. So initially, I really thought that, um, you know, people have studied these membrane-mediated interactions quite a bit. And I really thought that we would put these um, channels into the membrane due to the membrane-mediated interactions that each channel bends a little bit to the membrane or um, fields fluctuation-mediated interactions. So they will start aggregating. But actually, that was not the case. If those um, interactions are there, they're very weak. We tried also different um, hydrophobic mismatches. We tried uh, seeing whether there's any physical way in this model that we can reproduce um, membrane-mediated aggregation. And the effect was really so weak. 
And then we realized that the only way we could reproduce this aggregation that has been seen in in vitro experiments is if we put weak non-specific attraction between these proteins. And we know that proteins do have non-specific interactions in general. And you can imagine that if they like hydrophobic uh, tails of the um, lipid, they might also like each other. So what we did, we put very weak um, kind of 1KT interaction between um, the rods of uh, the channel. And then what happened kind of to our surprise, okay, they started aggregating, which is not that surprising given that we put the attraction in, but they started closing up cooperatively. So here you see the pore size as they come together. So channels uh, move on their own when they're far away. And then once they come close to each other, they close up. And it's a pure geometric effect. So when they're uh, closed, they're more upright and they can stick better to each other. So we realized that um, there is really some cooperativity and exactly like this in vitro experiment suggested that channels help each other close rather than open. And then we um, studied the uh, gating of the channels as a function of, of the cluster size. And we saw that the bigger the cluster, the uh, less open a channel is on average. So this is opening probability per channel versus the cluster size, and it saturates around uh, six. Um, so this was um, interesting, but we were still kind of curious what could um, this clustering really do? How does it uh, regulate the uh, conductance of the channels? So we did a little experiment where we preformed a cluster under so under quiescent conditions, and then we suddenly apply the shock. And what we see happening is, um, so when channels are under quiescent conditions, they, they aggregate. When shock is applied, they disperse. And that's clearly seen here as channels, uh, as the shock is applied, channels separate and their pore goes up. So what happens is, as shock is applied, membrane tension increases, that opens up a channel, and then they're not in that upright conformation anymore where they can stick to each other, but they're in this kind of uh, shifted configuration where they cannot um, interact with each other so well, so they disperse. And in fact, we realized that this simple um, physical beads and spring system has embedded uh, positive feedback. Basically, when there is no stress, when the membrane is relaxed, these guys are closed and they um, like to aggregate. And then when there is tension in the membrane, the membrane is stretched, the um, channels want to open up, and that creates them to disperse. And then as the um, osmotic pressure uh, equilibrates, the tension equilibrates, they start aggregating again. So there is some sort of encoded um, feedback between their aggregation state and their gating properties. And then we teamed up with uh, the Pirlijata lab in Edinburgh, where they study uh, E. coli under osmotic shock. So they put uh, a bacterium into um, a hypoosmotic conditions, then water flows in, the membrane tenses. And what they do, they measure single cell volume. And they see that um, as the shock is, uh, as a bacterium experiences a hypoosmotic shock, the volume goes up. So the uh, cell plumps up. At this point, the channels open. And then the volume uh, slowly equilibrates as the osmotic shock, uh, osmotic pressure gets equilibrated. So um, what we did with Teleta's lab, we um, used um, a set of, kind of um, um, uh, equations that they use to describe the flux through these channels. And we embedded um, in their model, the clustering of the channels. So exactly the curve that we saw, basically how the gating depends on the clustering state. And then we saw, as we switched the amount of clustering, that basically when there is no clustering at all, the cell loses volume much quicker than when you have this positive feedback between aggregation and the uh, gating. And the hypothesis is that this dynamic clustering can possibly protect cells from leaking. And you can imagine that, you know, let's say if a cell was grown in uh, hyposmotic conditions, it will, it, we know that it will express more channels. And you can imagine it might not need all these channels um, when the conditions are different and this condition, these channels might be uh, unnecessarily um, leaking. 
So this aggregation under conditions when they're overexpressed must help them close up. And then when um, they experience a shock again, they will spontaneously disperse and start uh, gating. And then as they gate, they will slowly start aggregating as they approach um, quiescent and conditions. So this was um, kind of a, a first story of our trying to reproduce machinery of life using beads and springs at a nanoscale, where we saw that the channel assembly actually decreases activity of individual channel. And this is the assembly activity is coupled and shock dependent. And it seems to be an effective kind of um, passive adjustment mechanism uh, that might be a way to sequester unnecessary channels and prevent overgating. Um, so this concludes my first little story on sensing forces. And I'll, we'll move into something that we build, that we develop next, which is uh, producing forces by protein assemblies. So this was really a first story where we realized that in order to capture the physics of life at the nanoscale, we really need to start considering non-equilibrium conditions and driving forces at the cell um, that, that protein assemblies in the cell experience. Um, so as a next step, we shifted towards assemblies that produce mechanical forces. Um, and this led to me realizing that the cell entry and cell exit are actually very different. So again, for the cell to live, the stuff needs to be able to go in and out. And to do so, the cell needs to reshape and cut its membrane, its physical barrier. And given that all the machinery needs to be on the inside, so the cytoplasm is here in gray, to uptake a material from outside in, the cell needs to cut the membrane neck from the outside of the neck. And you can imagine a pair of nano scissors that would kind of squish the membrane neck from the outside. But then to push something from, out, from inside out, given that the machine is still on the inside, it needs to cut the membrane neck from the inside. And it's difficult to imagine pair of scissors that will cut the neck from inside without getting in a way of scission. Um, and you can think that maybe that's some weird process that I um, you know, am tinkering with for my own geometrical entertainment, but actually this kind of scission from the inside is very important for the cell. It occurs in all sorts of um, cellular processes. Uh, for instance, in budding of viruses, in budding of vesicles, in the last step of cell division, you need to cut the membrane neck from the inside. And there's only one nanomachine across whole evolution that does this sort of geometrical transition of cutting a membrane neck from inside. It has a bit of a clumsy name, it's called escort, but it does all sorts of things. So uh, produces vesicles, produces viruses, cuts a cytokinetic bridge, it does also membrane repair. And it's really the only machine that can operate on all the membranes, so both the plasma membrane and also internal membranes. And it's a really interesting one from kind of a physics point of view. So let me tell you what it does. So it forms filaments that are spiral in shape here in pink, and they adsorb onto the membrane, which is gray. And then this spiral is kind of dead. It doesn't really do much until it consumes ATP through an other ATPase, through an ATPase that um, comes on top of it called VPS4. And then depending on the exact composition of this filament, because these filaments are heteropolymers, it can create um, kind of a downward deformation, pierce uh, the membrane in, it can create upward deformation, pull the membrane out, or it can cut the membrane neck, this is HIV scission, it can also do whole cell division in RKL cells. So you know, as physicists, we wonder, well, how does it work? How can you have uh, this flat spiral do all these different things? So uh, we decided to again do something very similar, build a simple beads and springs model where we build a spiral out of three beaded units. So it took us a long time to realize that three beads is the minimal unit needed to specify um, chirality in 3D. And then these beads, these are simple Leonard Jones beads, and these are uh, springs. So the blue beads adsorb onto the membrane. A membrane in this model is a one bead thick um, fluid deformable membrane that again captures the correct mechanical properties of um, biological membranes. And uh, these blue beads interact 
with a membrane by a non kind of non-specific generic um, adsorption that mimics uh, electri weak electrostatic interactions that these filaments use to adsorb onto the membrane. Um, and then again, there is no um, solvent. We run implicit solvent, large run uh, dynamics, these filaments. So let me show you what happens. So we have this filament and um, what we do, we impose some preferred curvature, which is constant throughout the filament. You already see that because it's uh, in a spiral shape, shape, not all parts of the filament will have the target curvature. So let's say only the middle will, and this inner part will be squished and the outer part will be stretched. So we thought that maybe this tension in the filament that we put in might um, lead to buckling instability. It can deform the membrane. And this was initially what we tried to capture in our simulations, also guided by the previous work of um, Martin Lenz and Aurelia Andrew. But basically, as you see here, when we let the spiral relax, the outside will want to go in, the inside will want to go out, but the filament will never go out of plane. It will just stay there. So we tried many different things, and we realized that the only way that we can capture what's seen in experiments is all these different shape changes is if the filament itself changes the shape, which we believe is driven by ATP. So if the filament changes its membrane binding position from flat into tilted, which you'll see here. So if we tilt it towards the outside, the spiral will naturally transform into a helix and you'll get downward deformation, just like what's been observed in experiment. And then if you shift it instead of outside, if you shift it towards the inside, you can recreate also upward deformation that's seen um, in some escort filaments. So we were very happy with this, but it was of course purely theoretical model, and it was simply the only scenario that we could find um, that recreates all these shape changes seen in the cell. Um, but interestingly, um, kind of a year after we uh, published this, several beautiful papers came out showing that these filaments can really have multiple binding faces, flat and tilted, and possibly um, the AT consumption of ATP changes the um, conformation from one to another. And then um, a really nice paper from the Rue group came out showing that these filaments indeed change their shape from a spiral into a helix, into a tighter helix, as they um, reshape the membrane. And in my opinion, that's a new way to produce forces at a nanoscale, because unlike actin and microtubules that consume energy at a level of individual monomer, here you have like a whole dead structure of a certain shape that is then remodeled into a different shape to deform the membrane. But then really the question is, what causes this filament geometry change that I was just talking about from flat into tilted or from spiral into a helix? So Aurelia and Rose group found that these filaments dynamically change their composition. So escort um, filaments in, in humans come in 12 copies and they can all cross polymerize at different stoichiometries. So what they found that this was done in yeast, um, they would the protein first assembles into one type of a filament that forms a spiral. And then this spiral templates another escort filament on top of it it kind of wants to be a helix. And then as the helix grows on top of the spiral, the spiral spontaneously disassembles and helix deforms the membrane. And then this helix templates the formation of a tighter helix on top of it. And in this way, they believe um, the membrane is deformed. So um, this was their hypothesis based on biochemical and some cryo-EM data. So we decided to try to capture it in, um, um, physical model again. So we thought that this can be recreated by polymer polymerizing three filaments together. So a flat spiral that has a flat membrane binding phase, then a wide helix that has a membrane binding phase on the outside, and then a tight helix that um, also has a membrane binding phase on the outside. So let me show you uh, what happens. So first we start, start with a spiral. Nothing really happens when the spiral is there. Then this spiral will bind a helix on top of it, and together they will make something mixed. And then when the spiral is depolymerized, the helix transforms the membrane into a deeper neck. And then we polymerize tight helix on top of it. And oops, 
and as the tight helix um, polymerizes, the white helix is depolymerized, and in that way you can constrict the membrane. But we realized as the last helix depolymerizes, which has been seen in experiments, the membrane just retracts back. So you can reshape the membrane, but you cannot really cut it unless the cargo is present. And that's exactly what they saw in the experiment. They had to put in glass beads to get scission. So what we did, we put just a volume excluded bead in the middle of, um, of the spiral. So this volume excluded bead just lightly attaches to the membrane and doesn't have enough um, adhesion to completely wrap. So let me show you what happens now as these filaments go again through the same composition, um, hence shape changes, so spiral, wide helix, tight helix. The membrane produces tight neck and the cargo just sits there due to its volume. And then as this last helix is depolymerized, the neck gets naturally cut because the cargo cannot squish through. So the next best thing is just to cut the membrane. And we didn't impose decision by any move. This simply occurs um, due to thermal fluctuation. So this was the first model for this next decision from the inside. And again, disassembly is key. And often <laughs> I like to remind people here that these look pretty because of course we color them uh, nicely, but these are not animations. They contain the correct physics given the minimal ingredients that we imposed. Okay, so here I've shown you that active changes in the composition of protein filaments can drive um, the complete uh, geometry change of the assembly, which are then transferred into the membrane reshaping. And to me, this is really, again, a new type for force production at a nanoscale. But what we really wanted to get is some quantitative matching to experiment. And it's difficult in the system that I've just shown you because there's so many copolymers and everything happens in tight necks, which are difficult to measure or uh, to visualize and let alone see what's going on inside. So together with Buzz Baum uh, from the LMB in Cambridge, um, we had this um, dream to go to um, the evolutionary origins of this machinery and kind of study its physical principles there. And then if the machinery does a similar function across evolution, some physics had to be preserved, even though the machine itself might be simpler. So what I've learned um, in this journey, which absolutely I didn't know before, is that the tree of life has three branches, archaea and bacteria, which at some archaea and bacteria to um, unicellular pro uh, prokaryotic branches that then merge together to give rise to eukaryotes. And bacteria went on to become our mitochondria and archaea went to become nucleus and the outer membrane. So actually the machinery uh, for reshaping the membranes that we have, we inherited from archaea. And in particular, this escort machinery that I mentioned cuts um, the bridge in the last step of um, cell division, which is around one micron, um, is used in archaea to cut the whole cell into, which is also around one micron. So um, what Buzz's group managed to do is to culture the closest rel archaeal relative to eukaryotes that can be grown in the lab, which is called sophologus, and image it um, at kind of quite crazy conditions. So these um, archaeal cells live, of sophologus live at like 80 Celsius and pH 2, so <laughs> quite harsh conditions. But I managed to um, image them um, under microscopes. So this is the DNA, this is um, roughly the cell. And I managed to uh, fluorescently label the escort filaments. And I'll show you what happens here. So this is, um, first escort filament, it polymerizes in the middle of the cell, and then it templates another escort three filament here uh, shown in green. So this is kind of, again, the same idea of filament on one shape templating another filament. And then the whole complex consumes ATP and the bottom filament disassembles the pink one and the top one, uh, which is in green, then squishes the cell into. So um, we thought really this is, is the same idea to what I discussed before, just instead of these many, many filaments, you kind of have only two or three. So um, 
in our mind, uh, the first filament wants to polymerize um, in a curvature that matches the cell curvature, but then the one that polymerizes on top of it really wants to have smaller radius of curvature, but cannot if it's bound to the first one. So only when the first one is disassembled, this guy on the top will want to achieve its small radius of curvature and will drag the membrane with it. So to model this, we have it really again the same approach of a filament that matches the cell curvature and then to model this disassembly of the template filament, which suddenly changed the curvature of the filament from a large radius into a small one, thinking that we'll transform this ring into a tight helix that will squish the cell. Okay, so let me show you what happens. We start with a filament inside of a vesicle. We suddenly change its curvature. And what we see is that in this way, we can really constrict the cell, but of course, filament stays there and glues the cells together. So clearly you need to have disassembly again, and ATP is consumed for this. But of course, if you do disassembly too quickly, nothing will really happen because you will not achieve the tight neck before the whole filament disassembles, so there is no scission. But if you disassemble at the right rate, you will be able to cut the neck in two. And indeed, um, in Buzz's experiment, the um, intensity of the proteins from the filament in the cytoplasm go up as, as the membrane um, cuts. So clearly the filament does need to disassemble. So we were happy with this, but what we were really excited about is that we can start doing quantitative comparison now. So what we get from Buzz's data is a bunch of movies where he um, images them dividing, and then we can measure the diameter of the cell in time. And we can do the same in our simulations. And we thought it would be a nice thing to compare, kind of how the diameter of the cell changes in time. So this is uh, their data. And surprisingly, you know, these cells can have a slightly different sizes. So if we scale the diameter with the initial size and the time with the total division time, all the cells fall onto the same curve. So kind of there is some plateau in the beginning, then almost a linear decrease in the um, division rate and then followed by a plateau. And then we measure exactly the same in our um, simulations. Again, all the data falls on the same curve, but the two curves, experiment and simulations, don't really match at all. So in our simulations, we decrease diameter very quickly, followed by a plateau. And you know that's not so surprising. I told you we initially instantaneously changed the filament curvature. So it's like releasing a loaded spring. So there's a huge force applied in the beginning, and then um, it um, plateaus before the cell divides. And then actually, if you look at our filament, I promised we were gonna change the shape from large radius into a tiny one. But what really happens is a bunch of these little coils. And that's, those are inversions in filament, in uh, helix chirality called perversions. And they're a consequence of buckling instability that is known to uh, appear in nature. So <clears throat> these perversions were actually first identified by Darwin and plant tendrils, but then people have found them in the shape of the gut due to differential growth of two materials in uh, synthetic polymers. But also if you go to cryo structures of escort filaments, you see that the filament is not really helix. It has lots of these inversions of chirality. And it's the same physics um, that's um, present in coiling of your uh, ribbon for Christmas. And we know how to control this number of preversions. So basically the shape of the filament. We know if we change the curvature very quickly, so if you coil your ribbon very quickly, you'll get loads of these preversions, so metastable state. But if you do, do it slowly, you will approach the ground state, which is a perfect helix. So that made us realize that probably we should think about these perversions, how many we have, how they're distributed, and then you really enter deep into the business of non-equilibrium protocols, right? You can do your changes at different rates, you can do it from one end, you can do it 
randomly um, you could do it from both ends so we tried lots of these different protocols and they really do change the number of helices the number of these perversions the energy of the filament the distribution of tension uh, uh, around the filament and long story short we found that only one protocol recapitulates the what we see in experiment really well and that's of course the simplest one where we change the curvature of the filament at random positions that's really the protocol that gives uh, perfect alignment with what we see in experiment without any fitting and it's also the protocol that gives the more the most reliable division and the most symmetric division and this division seems to be quite symmetric from what we see in experiment and the reason why it's reliable is because it's the tension is uniformly distributed around the film and it also this seems to be the most plausible mechanism for this Nano machine, if it can attach anywhere on the filament to change its composition, hence to change the shape, that's probably the best strategy. If it if it were to go from one end, you block that end, and then you're kind of done with your division. So here I'll wrap up saying that we found the first physical mechanism um, for archaeal division by square three filaments, which seems to be a new in our minds mechanism for the division where you have this super coiling of a filament that um, drives the cell to constrict. And then the very last step is um, caused by wrapping of a membrane around the individual coil, coil between before the membrane cuts. And to me, it's also a, a nice playground for testing how specific non-equilibrium protocols behind nanomachine result um, in a function is its robustness and um, uh, its performance. And actually many, uh, there are several labs across Europe that are trying to reconstitute this um, escort, archaeal escort system inside vesicles for kind of the purpose of a minimal cell division system. And I think this kind of a model can help with that too. And if I have just a couple of more minutes, and then there's only two slides. I'll comment on something we've been recently playing with quite a bit. So I, I've been showing you how we used physics to kind of understand ways of sensing forces and uh, producing forces across evolution. But then also in the collaboration with Buzz, we decided to maybe go the other way around, use evolution to help us understand physics. So we were really inspired by this work where the group used uh, genetic algorithms and simulations to design bipeds that walk fast and straight. So basically start with a random uh, guess and then use genetic algorithms to evolve something that uh, can walk well. We were thinking, can we apply the same logic at a nanoscale? So here really the situation is deterministic. At the nanoscale, things work on average, but we can capture this in simulations. We can do lots of... Um, replicas and then see on average how our machine performs. And my idea was to give a filament to the system and evolve it such that it divides me a cell in two, which is of course too ambitious for the first project. So we scaled down to something uh, simpler. So I start with a particle that's covered in ligands and I ask my uh, algorithm to evolve me a structure that passes through the membrane the most quickly and the most efficiently. So I didn't change the number of ligands, I just changed their arrangements. So the thermodynamics is the same. The only thing that changes is basically kinetics. And I'll show you what happens. We start with a random gas, doesn't really go in. We then um, basically do a bunch of these. We measure their performance. We mate them, mutate them, separate them into deems, then merge them later. And this here, I'm showing the best individuals of each generation. Generation five deforms better. Generation 10, I think, goes in already. And generation 35 goes in faster and more reliably, meaning that more um, replicas from the generation go in. So in this way, we managed to evolve particles that do stuff, in this case, uh, transfer the membrane. But what was really interesting is that we managed to learn which designs work, which not. And again, long story short, we realized that arranging these ligands into lines instead of having them uniformly distributed or clustered in some clusters works much better. So the best performing individuals, and we evolved, I think, 60,000 different designs, all had um, 
elegance in these lines. And to me, what this really taught me is that I have very poor intuition for the nanoscale because I would have never guessed that this design would be the best one to try. And I think uh, this approach might help us to infer designs of nanomachines that we wouldn't have thought of putting in our model and possibly help us uh, evolve some new nanostructures of uh, desired properties. So here I'll wrap up. And I really need to thank the group uh, who did all the work. I'll exit the mechanosensitive channels. Lena, Sharon, Billy, and Chris did uh, the escort stuff, and Joel did this artificial evolution. And Buzz taught us everything we know uh, about evolution and escort, uh, together with Aurelian and Anna Fitzner in his group, and Ricardo helped us uh, with data analysis. And this is my group at our uh, retreat last weekend. I know for this crowd, the, um, the scenery might not be impressive, but we were quite happy. And um, I'll also say that we have two uh, postdoc positions available um, at IST Austria, where we are actually moving in a month. And I'll thank you and take any questions. <laughs>